Hello and welcome to Unsolved, Getting Away with Murder. Orkney is a community not exactly renowned for violent crime, but that peaceful image was shattered nearly ten years ago in an act of almost unimaginable brutality. An apparently motiveless random killing spread fear and alarm among islanders, casting a dark shadow over the community that remains to this day. At the time, a psychological profiler warned police the gunman could very likely strike again. The killer is still at large. Orkney's peaceful image was smashed on the evening of the 2nd of June 1994 when Bangladeshi waiter Shamsuddin Mahmood was shot dead in front of horrified customers at the Mumataz Indian restaurant in the island's capital, Kirkwall. Ten years on, the fallout from this brutal, seemingly motiveless random killing is still being felt throughout this quiet community. They were shocked, they were traumatised. Uh, as you can understand, a motiveless murder happening like this they would all obviously be thinking, am I next? Um, and that situation prevailed. They were very uneasy for a long time. I think it was a, 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 an incredible chapter in Orkney's recent history. It's, it's a crime that will never be forgotten about while it remains unsolved. I think people here generally would like to see this cleared up. It would be nice to know that the person who did this had finally been convicted and put away for this. 26-year-old Shamsuddin Mahmood, affectionately known as Shamal to staff and customers, had worked at the Mumataz as a waiter two years previously. He liked Orkney, and by all accounts the locals liked him, and he'd returned two months before the killing to take over as manager. We are seven brothers and he's youngest. He's a young, sociable person, very pleasant, and he has no enemy, he had no enemy. He graduated with economics. The family wanted him to become a lawyer. And his sudden death is a great loss to the family. We still remember him and mourn his death. He's a good worker and a kind person. And easy to get on with. Very good with the customers. And quite just a nice person. Everything they could find out about him initially pointed to someone from a, a fairly humble background, someone who'd come over to this country looking to, to make some money so he could go back to Bangladesh to marry his girlfriend, who we found out was a, trying to become a doctor. The facts surrounding Shamal Mahmood's mother are not in question. The restaurant was busy that night. Shamal was serving a table occupied by local businessman Donald Blue and his family when the gunman strolled in. It was a lovely summer's evening in Kirkwall. It was June, lovely night, uh, lots of visitors about. Good evening, sorry to keep you waiting. Marion Flores and Shamal Mahmood were working in the restaurant serving these customers when at about quarter past seven uh, this man walked into the restaurant I heard the door opening behind me and I looked round and the, a man standing there with a hood, hooded top and mask on. And I thought it was a choke to begin with and then I saw the gun and I thought he was in to rob the restaurant. He went past me and I heard a shot. I think I saw him fall into the ground, but I went out through the door. Donald Lou and his brother-in-law began to chase him down the lane at the side when they, they realised it wasn't a terribly good idea to chase somebody with a gun who had just shot somebody. So they then turned and went back into the restaurant. 
Orkney is not a community where violent crime is common. This was only the second murder on the islands in a quarter of a century, and the reaction was one of stunned disbelief. Word spread like wildfire that there had been a shooting at the Indian restaurant. I remember on the night of the killing, I was at the radio station, my wife was here at the house. She was working as a journalist at that time, and she took something like 90 phone calls that night, mainly from other journalists, news organisations and so on, wanting to find out what on earth was going on. But a lot of calls from people in the community as well, also wanting to know what was going on and w were people at risk, you know, had this, where was this person who'd, who'd committed this incredible crime? Was he still at large? I think particularly at that time, a lot of people would leave their doors unlocked at night. This isn't, a, you know, a community where there is that much crime. Doors were locked. In a community where a car theft makes front page news, local police were not equipped to cope with a murder investigation. Detectives were brought in from the mainland. They travelled through the night from Inverness, arriving in Orkney in the early hours of the following morning. We had to seal the island off effectively for about three days. Everybody coming and going by plane and boat was checked. Full details were established from them. We visited all guest houses and hotels on the whole of Kirkwall, eh, Orkney, not just Kirkwall, got details of who had been staying there. As I say, it was the summer. Lots of people were there from all over the world. House to house inquiries were conducted in every single house in Kirkwall. The police thought that someone in the community, because they kept saying this killer could still be here, there's a chance he's, he's here, that, so there's the chance that a man with a gun, an extremely dangerous man, is still at large in the community. One of the first things police did was attempt to establish a motive. But try as they might, they just couldn't come up with a reason as to why anyone would want to gun down Shamal Mahmood in cold blood. Uh, I don't think he had any, any enmity with anyone. He was a pleasant person, so there shouldn't be any reason for anyone to kill him. There would be um, that it was a, a, a f an ethnic feud, that it was drug related, that it was money owed, that it was a contract killing, that it was... Um, uh, uh, something no. to do with Bangladesh, something yes, to do with uh, the time he was in Southampton, something yes. to do with the time he was in no, London. A, 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 a romantic liaison that had gone wrong, or, or uh, there were all sorts of suggestions yes. being put forward. We went through weeks and then months of work uh, without finding the trigger, the hook, the, the motive for the crime. We couldn't get any focus on it. We looked at whether it was something to do with you know, a local girl, uh, did he have monetary problems, was it something to do with Indians or Bangladeshis in Britain, was it something to do with his family, there was a whole broad range of issues that we examined and we couldn't find anything and we were really struggling. Obviously there was never a breakthrough and the impression you got as the weeks went by, as two weeks went by, three weeks, four weeks, seven weeks, fourteen weeks, that this was a, a baffling, disappointing, incredibly frustrating case for the, the police involved. I, I think a unique case for the, the, the very senior police officer in charge of it, a unique case in his experience. In, I, I remember him telling me that this was unique in Scottish terms, in UK terms, because there was no motive. It was the motiveless crime. Eyewitness accounts on the night were also unreliable. Because the gunman was completely covered up, diners gave different descriptions. A photo fit was released of a man seen acting suspiciously in the vicinity of the restaurant before and after the killing, but this failed to generate much of a public response. But from the outset, police did have one tangible piece of evidence, the bullet casing recovered from the restaurant floor. When the gunman walked up to Shamul, he just shot the gun almost at point blank range into the waiter's head. The bullet uh, was going with such force it, it exited the back of his head and lodged itself in the plasterboard wall behind him. The casing was ejected from the gun and it was recovered on the floor of the restaurant. We had our local firearms expert um, look at the bullet to see whether we could establish was it significant, was it a different from any other bullet, where was it made, what calibre it was. That firearms expert was Constable Eddie Ross seen here on duty outside the restaurant. His military background and involvement in the local territorial army unit made him ideally suited to the task. 
Part of his job with the local force was to dispose of illegally held firearms by sawing them up and throwing them into the sea. He told detectives it was a 9mm calibre bullet, one of a massive consignment manufactured at the Kirki Arsenal in India. He was tasked to check all firearms registers to see who held guns. He then visited each owner of a 9mm weapon and he took three test fires from each gun so that they could be sent away to the laboratory for analysis and the lab were subsequently able to tell us that none of these guns could have fired the fatal bullet and uh, nowhere on the island could we find that type of ammunition. It was frustrating for police, who by this stage were already checking out another potential lead. Shortly after the murder, a woman came forward with information that two weeks before the killing, she and her daughter witnessed a young man acting strangely in Papdale Woods, near the local secondary school. He'd been dotting from tree to tree, like stalking, if you like, hiding behind trees, waited there as if waiting for somebody, then repeated the process and dotted tree to tree all the way back to where he had started. Are you watching that nut in the woods, Mum? Yeah, yeah, I am. Go get the binoculars. He was wearing clothing very similar to what the gunman was wearing, if you like, balaclava, completely covered up, hooded top, that sort of gear. They went back to the tree he had begun from and uh, took the clothing off, by which time the woman's daughter was also present. So they watched him uh, in great detail. For probably about half an hour they were watching this chap. So they were able to give us a fairly detailed description of what he was doing and eventually when he took the hooded top off, what he looked like. Police fail to identify the man, but they tell the mother and daughter to contact them immediately if they see him again. Weeks go by, and frustration among investigating officers grows as every avenue they go down leads to a dead end. But then, two months after the killing, they receive information which turns the case on its head. It comes from an unexpected source, Constable Eddie Ross. And what he tells police ends up putting his own son, 15-year-old Michael, in the frame for murder. The morning of the 12th of August, 1994, is one detectives on duty at Orkney's main police station will never forget. Up to now, their inquiries into Shamal Mahmood's murder had drawn a blank. Firearms expert Constable Eddie Ross is about to go home from night shift when he discloses some startling information. I was speaking to him to try and establish if we could get an address for the Kirk Arsenal because I knew that he had a collection of books that may give us things like that. Um, while speaking to him and asking him for this address, he told me he had a box of the same bullets which I would have to say astonished me because we had been looking for these for several weeks before. That was the focus of our inquiry. I asked him where he got it, the box, and he told me that he couldn't remember. Um, I sent the civilian driver with him to collect the box that he had and asked him to give a lot of thought as to where he got it. The following afternoon, Ross reveals he'd been given the bullets some years previously by James Spence, a former Royal Marine, now back in Orkney working as a road sweeper. He told us that he had given Eddie two boxes of bullets, one being the significant 9mm batch from India and the other box being um, 0.22 bullets. Um, he stuck to that, he wouldn't be swayed from that at all. There was only the one box of the 9mm bullets he'd given that to Eddie, there was no more than that one box. Less than a month later, on the 8th of September, the inquiry takes another twist. One of the witnesses who'd seen the man acting strangely in Papdale Woods two weeks before the murder phones police to say she spotted him. He was leaving a bakery in Kirkwall's main street. The police check CCTV footage and the man is identified as Michael Ross, 15-year-old son of Constable Eddie Ross. We spoke to Michael initially in his father's presence, asked him 
had he been in Papter Woods and had any, any knowledge of that, and he denied it completely, saying he had never been in Papter Woods acting in the way that the woman described. We did ask him about the murder investigation as well, and he gave us an alibi for that night. Checks into Michael's background reveal he shares his father's passion for all things military. He was a member of the island's army cadet unit. Police check his alibi for the night of the murder and find it doesn't stand up. They take him back in for questioning on the 2nd of December. Now 16, he admits it was him in Papdale Woods, but denies anything to do with the murder. When we asked him why he had been in there and what was he doing, he claimed that he'd been waiting for um, somebody who'd been in school with him. I think the story was that this chap had been beating up his girlfriend and Michael was going to, to see to him if he'd come out of school on that occasion. We discovered that, that that chap, although he did exist, had left the school, I think it was several months previous. Three days later, with suspicion growing about the Ross family, road sweeper James Spence is questioned again. On this occasion, he tells police that he gave Constable Ross not one, but two boxes of Kirky bullets, one of which had been opened. We asked him why he had not told us that in the first place. He said that on three occasions, Eddie had approached him and spoken to him and effectively asked, asked him to tell lies. If the police did come and tell him, uh, come and ask him about bullets, he was to say there was only the one box. The following day, sensing a major breakthrough, Police search the Ross home under warrant. Michael is detained and questioned about the murder. Neighbors and friends of the Rosses are stunned at the development. The family's vociferous supporters from Orpha become known to the police investigating team as the mob on the hill. Me and Shirley, I thought, you know, Shirley said, Michael, Shirley's very words were when we told them up. She says, Michael, she says, Michael wouldn't harm a fly. Michael was actually questioned for about 68 hours, a long time. Like Eddie had said to me even at the time that he'd been questioned that long, he thought, you know, he's no home, he must have confessed or admitted to something. Then a few years later he appears home and said that, oh, he's denied everything, and Michael walks in and asks what's for tea. You know, I mean, a 15-year-old boy being grilled for eight hours by professional men, make him break couldn't make him break because he didn't do anything. I remember Moira saying that she just went up to the room and after it and just asked him and she says, Michael, did you shoot the Indian? And he says, just no, and I definitely know. And Moira just said she just knew, she knew at that moment he didn't do it. As the questioning continued, Michael stuck by his alibi for the murder. He continued to deny any involvement in the killing of Shamul Mahmood. Three months later, though, his father is suspended from duty and is later charged with hindering the investigation. The family and their supporters are shocked. He went in to try and help an investigation and it turned a 360 degree circle around the point finger at them. And nobody ever imagined it would go as far as it did. At Eddie Ross's trial in the High Court in Inverness in May 1997, his son Michael, who by now had joined the army, was named as a suspect in the murder inquiry. Under oath, police officers reveal his alibi had been proven false, that he'd been seen wearing similar clothes to the killer in Papdale Woods, and that he'd taken part in an identity parade. It's unbelievable and credulous. I mean, this boy was, what, 15 year, years of age, and he was assumed to, to do the murder of a 15 year old kid flying around in his BM, BMX bike. <laughs> That's what I mind him of. Oh, and then suddenly you do this horrendous crime and being calm and collected after it, it's just ridiculous. Anybody that walks in somewhere and kills somebody is a psycho that is bound to do it within 18 months, two years again. Bound to do it again. They're not going to just do it once and lead a normal life. The only people that do that are paid professionals. No, no 15 year old schoolboys. It's, it's going to hang over his head for the rest of his time. It's going to be one of that cases that they're going to conveniently say they know who did it but can't prove it. Eddie Ross was jailed for four years for deliberately hindering the murder investigation to prevent suspicion falling on himself or his family. The judge said 
His deception struck at the very heart of the criminal justice system. He's now back in Orkney, working as an undertaker. He declined to take part in this program. The case, described at the time as a thousand-piece jigsaw, remains open. But for nine years, a report has been with the procurator fiscal naming one prime suspect. The police, at least, are convinced they know who did it and are finally able to point to a motive. I believe um, that we've identified through the inquiry process evidence that indicates quite strongly that this was a, a racist crime. It was carried out. Uh, the motive was racial and I believe that makes it a more abhorrent crime. The prime suspect named in the report to the fiscal is Michael Ross. Married with a baby girl, he's in the Black Watch Regiment and is currently an instructor at the Catholic Training Barracks in Yorkshire. Through the army, we asked Michael Ross whether he wanted to take part in this program. Like his father, he declined the offer. We're not going to get our brother back. Uh, the loss is permanent to us, but justice should be done. The offender should not go unpunished. He should receive his due share. I think that would be a, a, a feeling that a lot of people here would share, that um, it's not right that a killing like this could happen in cold blood in front of people, and uh, the person responsible gets away with it. If Shamal Mahmood was the victim of a random racist killing, it makes the murder even more abhorrent and more difficult to comprehend for the victim's family. Police believe they're not that far away from bringing a person before a jury in this case, but are still missing that final piece of evidence to complete the jigsaw. Until that happens, Shamal Mahmood's murder will continue to stain Orkney's reputation. Join us next time when we focus on the brutal murder of brilliant Aberdeen University scientist, Brenda Page. Thank you.